chapter 11. Catman. A single bulb flicked on above Ben's head. He stood inside the portal's inner chamber, a space that was quiet and calm. While the floor was solid, the walls were formed by a vortex swirling around the perimeter. Ben would have felt a lot more secure if the walls had been made out of plywood instead of wind. A person can't tumble backwards and fall through wood. Destination, please. A squeaky voice belonged to the portal's captain, someone the apprentices had never met. And while they had always heard this voice, they had never seen him. And since there was no place for the captain to hide, Ben was starting to believe that the captain wasn't actually on board the portal. Instead, his voice was being transmitted from someplace else, maybe a control tower. Ben wondered what kind of creature it was. The Griffin's Palace, Mr. Tappy said. Ooh, a palace, Pearl whispered to Ben. Setting course coordinates, the, the pilot announced. Fasten your seatbelts and prepare for takeoff. But there were no belts because there were no seats. Dr. Wu had said that they were being reupholstered. Ben thought this was very strange and very dangerous. Seatbelts were the law back home. The floor began to vibrate. Ben stepped closer to Pearl, keeping as far away from the edges as possible. He didn't want to admit he had a couple of nightmares about falling out and finding himself alone in the middle of, well, nowhere. After informing the pilot of their destination, Mr. Tabby remained silent, both hands clutching his satchel. The trip lasted a good five minutes, which was a very long time to be jolted about. I could never be an astronaut, Pearl said as she held both hands over her stomach. Why is this taking so long? Can't this go any faster? Ben had no idea how fast they were going. Thanks to his math teacher who had taught a unit on speed, Ben knew that airplanes flying between Los Angeles and Buttonville traveled at roughly 460 miles an hour. He had learned that sound travels around 700 miles an hour and that light travels at 186,000 miles per second. In science fiction movies, starships dart between galaxies at warp speed. But how fast did one travel between dimensions? According to the training video he and Pearl had watched, the portal moved in all directions at the same time. But if you moved in all directions at once, didn't that mean you weren't moving at all? Are we there yet? Pearl asked. Destination ahead, prepare for a landing, said the pilot. Ben wasn't sure what to do, so he stiffened his legs and gripped the soles of his shoes with his toes. Just as his stomach began to churn, the turbulence stopped. Destination reached, said the pilot. An exit sign illuminated. Thank you for choosing the portal for your interdimensional travel needs. Oh, finally, Pearl said as she followed, followed by a little burp. I thought I was going to lose my breakfast. Ben unclenched his jaw and sighed with relief. They had made the journey in one piece. There was, of course, still the return trip that he had to worry about. He would feel completely at ease only once they had touched down on the 10th floor and he could feel the dust-covered floorboards beneath his shoes. Um, Mr. Tabby, said Pearl, what's wrong? Mr. Tabby stood perfectly still, staring at the exit sign. Mr. Tabby, Pearl gently tapped on his arm. Shouldn't we go? He still didn't move. He didn't even blink. What was he thinking? Was he worried about something? Mr. Tabby, Ben said quietly. Did he dare ask the question? Why did the note say that you were forbidden to access the imaginary world? He and Pearl waited, their anxious breathing only sounds in the portal. Even the mysterious pilot who usually told them to make their way to the exit was quiet. Mr. Tabby took a long breath. And then he set the satchel down on the floor and looked at the apprentices. Before we step foot into the imaginary world, there is something I must tell you. He tugged on his vest and smoothed out a few wrinkles. I am not exactly how I seem. 
Ben pondered this statement. Couldn't he say the same thing about himself? Everyone might think that he looked like an ordinary boy, but he had traveled between dimensions, played fetch with a dragon, and been headbutted by a satire. There was nothing ordinary about that. I know you're not exactly what you seem, Pearl said to Mr. Tabby. You're a cat. Well, we figured that out a long time ago. Ben winced, expecting Mr. Tabby to growl with disapproval. Sure, Ben had the same suspicions, but he wasn't going to come right out and accuse Dr. Wu's assistant of being a cat. Kind of seemed rude. But the evidence did add up. When Ben and Mr. Tabby met for the first time, he had made a comment about the hamster tasting delicious with pepper. Another time, he mentioned that parakeets tasted good with mustard. And then there was the way that he growled and his yellow flashing eyes and his amazing sense of smell and who could ignore the mustache it looked just like a set of whiskers. And then there'd also been a tail. Both Ben and Pearl had seen it just one time though. Is it true? Ben asked. Oh, of course it's true, Pearl said. He eats those furry mouse crackers. Mackers. Mr. Tabby corrected. He opened the satchel and pulled out a box. Mackers, mouse flavored crackers. You'd have to be whackers to eat only one. I suggest you put a few in your pockets. I cannot resist the odor of a mouse and you may need to tempt me from wandering. Wandering, Ben asked as he grabbed a couple of crackers by their tails and tucked them into his pocket. When I am transformed into my feline shape, my instincts take over and I cannot resist the scent of a mouse or rat or any other rodent type. Transformed? Pearl bounced on her toes. You mean I'm right? You're really a cat? Oh, I am a beckono. Oh, that was Duke. A beckono, he said, a shape-shifting cat. I was born in the imaginary world, so my true form is feline. But when I live in the known world, I take the form of Mr. Tabby. I must always have opposable thumbs in order to do my job as Dr. Wu's assistant. Cool, Ben said. But if you were born in the imaginary world, then why did Vinny show us that note saying that you were forbidden to come here? The moment I step into the imaginary world, I return to my feline form. And the longer that I stay in this world, the more cat-like I become. If I stay too long, I will simply forget all about my life with Dr. Wu. Oh, that would be bad, Pearl said. Then you shouldn't leave the portal. We can get the griffin's feather by ourselves. All we need are directions to the palace. Directions simply won't suffice, and no map exists. Only those who have been before can find the Griffin's Palace, and that is why I have accompanied you today. He pulled a harness and a leash from the satchel. When we step into the imaginary world, you must immediately place this around me. Never let me let off the leash or out of your sight. He looked at both of them sternly. Do not let me wander, and if the mission should go awry, do not leave me behind. Do you understand? Oh, we would never leave you behind, Pearl said, grabbing the leash and harness. Ben nodded in agreement. Mr. Tabby reached into the satchel again and removed a vial of ye yellow fairy dust that hung on a string. He slipped it around his neck. The dust was the only way to summon the portal for the return trip. I will lead you to the palace, but I will not be able to speak. It will be up to you to get the feather from the Griffin King. Remember to bow and be very, very polite. Dr. Wu is counting on you. Are you ready? Of course, Pearl said. This won't be too hard. You lead us to the king. We ask him for a feather. What could go wrong? Ben almost laughed. If there was one thing that he knew for certain, something always went wrong. And then again, 
things always went right, too. Leaving the satchel behind, Mr. Tabby stepped beneath the exit sign into the swirling wind and disappeared from view. Pearl gave Ben a reassuring smile and followed. Ben hesitated. Was Mr. Tabby really going to turn into a cat? Would the Griffin King like them enough to give them a feather? Would they find out what happened to the last apprentice? And the biggest worry of all, would they run into the dangerous Maximus Steel? Proceed to the exit, the pilot ordered. The wind whipped around Ben's hair and howled in his ears as he pushed through the tornado. As soon as he stepped into the imaginary world, the portal vanished. No wind, no thunder, just silence. Except for a little quiet sound, like the miniature sound of a motorboat. Ben looked down. Sitting at his feet was a reddish-orange cat with big yellow eyes and twitching whiskers. And he was purring. Kind of looks like Mr. Tabby. See you soon.